boy has slipped the surly bonds of earth and danced the skies on laughter silvered wings. Sunward I've climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun split clouds and done a hundred things you have not dreamed of. Wheeled and soared and swung high in the sunlit silence. Hovering there, I chased the shouting wind along and flung my eager craft through footless halls of air. Up, up the long, delirious, burning blue, I've topped the windswept height with easy grace. Where never lark or even eagle flew. And while with silence, lifting mind, I prod the high, untrespassed sanctity of space, put out my hand and touch the face of God. the second installment of The Dad Project. In this installment, we have newly minted Ensign Purvis, Academy Class of 1957, receiving his orders to proceed to Pensacola, Florida for flight training, where he would fly the venerable T-34 Mentor and the T-28 Trojan. Now, by way of background, there are any number of ways to become a pilot and more than several places to train for that outcome. For Navy pilot hopefuls like my father, that destination is Pensacola, Florida a location nearly as far west as you can go in Florida before you trip into Alabama. And for those Navy pilots with even bigger dreams of flying, it is also the home base of the Navy's Blue Angels. American naval presence began there when it was designated the Pensacola Navy Yard in 1825, four years after Spain ceded control of this territory to the United States in 1821. Now, Fast forwarding to the early years of Navy flight training, it would be on Greenberry Point at the Naval Aviation Camp across the Severn River from the Naval Academy from 1911 to 1914 that is considered the first organized military flight training in the Navy. Before that, pilots were trained at the factories that produced the aircraft the pilot was being trained to fly. It would be in February of 1914 that the Naval Air Base at Pensacola would finally be established. Following the signing of the Armistice in 1918 that ended World War I, over 1,000 naval aviators have been trained in fixed-wing aircraft, dirigibles, seaplanes, and frequent balloons at Pensacola. In the intervening years leading up to World War II, as few as 25 pilots were trained in 1923 to as many as 708 in 1940. During World War II, an astounding 64,770 naval aviators would be trained for the war effort. That effort would include many other aviators besides Pensacola. By the time my father arrived at Pensacola in 1957, in a year that would see 2,951 pilots designated as naval aviators, 90,747 naval aviators had come before him and an astounding 71% of that number had been trained during World War II. So, in June of 1957, on the heels of his academy graduation, my father reported to the U.S. Naval Air Station at Pensacola. Like his cohort, he would spend 16 weeks of intensive pre-flight training before moving on to flight training. This would include an additional two weeks of ground school before finally meeting up with an instructor for their orientation flight. Sometime in this pre-flight ground school period, he would have received his first flight manual for the T-34 and possibly for the T-28 as well, despite his first flight and the T-28 being a few weeks in the offing. It wouldn't be until 1961 that the Navy introduced the standardized NATOPS flight manuals. While sitting in my dad's hospital room, I did ask him about that first flight. He said it was a typical training curveball as he was marched off with his class to enjoy a heavy steak and egg breakfast before their orientation flights in the T-34. What wasn't fully explained was that part of the orientation flight was a full demonstration of the plane's capabilities and a test of the student's ability to keep their breakfast down. My dad said he had no problem keeping his meal down and he felt worse on his second flight. He said the T-34 was a forgiving, easy plane to fly like its design basis, the Beechcraft Bonanza. 
1946, the Beechcraft Bonanza, with its distinctive V-tail, received its approved type certificate and 10,000 were made over the next 30 years. Walter Beach founded Beach Aircraft Corporation in 1932 and before the Bonanza was best known for the Beechcraft Model 18 and arguably one of the most beautiful airplanes ever made, the Model 17 Stagger Wing. Both models were built for the military during World War II, so Walter Beach was familiar with the military procurement process. With this understanding and the success of the Bonanza, he proposed the T-34 as a less expensive and easier to fly trainer than the brutish but capable and outdated T-6 Texan that had been the main advanced trainer for the Allied Air Forces during World War II. The T-34 was basically a narrow-bodied Bonanza with a sturdier frame for full acrobatic performance. In fact, an earlier design included the V-tail, but was later dropped for the traditional rudder elevator configuration. The prototype was barnstormed throughout the country, South America, and overseas to great reception and success. Eventually, over 2,300 would be made and delivered to 23 Air Forces throughout the world. The Navy eventually would acquire 423 of the T-34Bs. More unusual was a third variant that restarted the T-34 production line in 1977 by replacing its reciprocating engine with a turboprop 353 T-34Cs were produced in a run that would last until 1990. The type was finally retired with the advent of the T-6 Texan II, another Beechcraft product, although being built by the Raytheon Corporation. Although very successful in the prop-driven trainer realm, the jet version of the T-34, the Model 73 Jet Mentor, never made it past the prototype stage, and it was the Cessna T-37 Dragonfly that would take on that role for the Air Force. Oddly, it was a French design trainer, the Fuga CM-170 Magister, that would incorporate a butterfly tail into a jet trainer. It was well received and eventually used by 20 different air forces for training, and in some cases used for close air support and light attack duties. The T-34 was never made for long-term relationships, but was made to be easily maintained, relatively easy to fly, and to fly three or four times a day to give the flight students the skills and confidence to move to the next level of flight training. So, with 38.7 hours of flight time under his belt, my father severed his relationship with the T-34 and moved on to the bigger, more powerful T-28 Trojan for advanced training. It would be a month of downtime before that would happen, so my dad took the time to marry my late mother, Angie Purvis of Washington, D.C., and take a honeymoon to Quebec. They would both head back to Pensacola, where they would prepare for my arrival at the appropriate interval in Kingsville, Texas. But, back to our story. Despite being designed in the late 40s, the T-28 was an airplane from an earlier era. Its big, blunt radial engine looked very much like the Wildcats, Hellcats, and Corsairs that were frontline fighters during World War II, its tricycle landing gear configuration being the only difference. Initially designed for the Air Force as the T-28A and entering service in 1952, the Navy Sioux signed on to the program and acquired 489 T-28Bs and 299 T-28Cs. Both Navy versions had twice the power as the Air Force version, and the C version was equipped with an arresting hook and would be used for carrier qualifications. Unlike the Air Force that phased out their T-28s in their early 60s in favor of an all-jet training curriculum, the Navy would retire their T-28s in 1984 to be replaced by the T-34C Turbo Mentor mentioned earlier. None of the variants built had ejection seats, so like its Navy predecessors, the canopy would be open when landing or taking off a carrier, so should the pilot find himself in the water, there was one less thing to worry about when egressing a soon-to-be-sinking aircraft. By the time the Navy retired its T-28 fleet in 1984, it was only the B model that was still being flown, the C models having been retired earlier because of the structural fatigue induced by the carrier landings. There was one more iteration of the T-28, and that would be the D model. These were former Air Force A models that were adapted and modified for counterinsurgency or coin operations for several small air forces like the South Vietnamese and Laotian Air Forces. Self-sealing fuel tanks, armor for the pilot, and six hard points on the wing for various munitions and gun pods were some of the modifications made to these aircraft. So, after 126.3 hours of quality time with the T-28, both B and C models, the Navy chose to break off their time together and ordered my father to NAS Kingsville in Texas, where he would be introduced to his next partner, the Grumman S2F Tracker. 
So next up will be newly minted Naval Aviator Lieutenant J.G. Purvis, Academy Class of 1957, having received his orders to proceed to Kingsville, Texas for continued flight training in type. He would be checked out and learn to fly the venerable S2F, affectionately known as the Stoof. In any case, thanks for joining me for the second installment of the Dad Project. I'm not selling anything or giving instruction on how to do anything. I'm telling a story I was hoping my father would tell me. Now I'm trying to tell it for him. So please subscribe if you'd like to hear more and hit the bell if you'd like to be sure to hear more. So thanks for joining me for the second installment of the Dad Project and I hope to see you for the third installment of the Dad Project. Until then, have a great evening and a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye.